Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Powers, Deutsche Bank's lead U.S. consumer package goods analyst, and I'm thrilled today to welcome Colgate Palmolive back to the conference. With us today are Chairman and CEO, Noel Wallace, who joins us for the first time since assuming his current role. For Colgate in Latin America and now also Asia Pacific region, the latter of which he assumed responsibility for last August. And John Fauché, the company's chief investor relations officer. Guys, welcome back to the conference. It's not face to face in Paris, but we'll make the most of it and look forward to a redo in person sometime soon. To kick us off, Noel and Penis will run through a brief presentation to frame the company's strategy and level set on priorities, both near term and long term. And then we'll open it up to broader Q&A. And all those listening via the conference portal should be able to submit questions at the bottom left of your screen. Apologies for the technical difficulty. Um, before we begin, I'd like to call your attention to Colgate's safe harbor statement, which should be on screen in front of you. With that, Noel, I'll pass it over to you. Well, thanks, Steve, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we are in Paris right now. Uh, joining me today, as, as Steve mentioned, is uh, Pano Serapas, our group president for Latin America and Asia Pacific. I thought I'd uh, begin kind of where we left off in uh, our Q1 earnings call, which was discussing COVID and provide you a, a quick update. Uh, no fundamental change uh, since our Q1 earnings call. Uh, pleasingly, our factories have broadly remained open, I think a testament to the incredible resilience of our supply chain, and importantly, India ramping back towards normal as we speak. Uh, we have seen several emerging markets, uh, particularly Russia and Brazil, with a rise in case count, which we will watch very carefully. And in Africa, obviously, continued disruption across that region as countries are taking important steps to halt the spread of the virus, which obviously has implications, as you see, uh, transfers of goods and uh, opening up of, of major economies. Uh, pantry destocking has begun, as we predicted, and we discussed in, in, in Q1 and anticipated, uh, notably in Europe, and you, you've probably seen that in recent scanner data. Uh, importantly, operationally, our teams continue to execute really well. I think we've been extremely pleased with the resilience and agility everyone has shown. And certainly, as we think about agility, a, a key capability that we're trying to build into our organization, and the crisis certainly has accelerated our learning in that area. Uh, first and foremost, the safety of, of, of our employees remains a top priority. Uh, we've begun a staggered return to work, which is great to see. Uh, in, in markets where regulations and policies allow us to do that. Uh, as you can imagine, this is primarily focused on jobs that need to be done at a facility. So, so for example, we moved our scientists back into our R&D facilities, uh, those that are focused on obviously developing our next generation innovation. And importantly, uh, we continue to progress on our global community efforts. We recognize our responsibility in that area. This includes our partnership with the World Health Organization and as you heard, our distribution of 25 million bars of soap to those in need all over the world, importantly including instructions on health and hygiene practices that are necessary to help combat uh, the COVID virus. So uh, today uh, we'd like to provide an update on our strategy, you know, where we are, how it positions us importantly for growth, uh, particularly in an uncertain world moving forward. As you know, our focus strategy is behind four key segments, oral care, pet nutrition, personal care, including our recent uh, premium uh, skin health business, and home care. Uh, four segments, uh, which as you probably know as well, all play an important role today in meeting consumers' changing behaviors, particularly in the health and hygiene space. A focus strategy that over the last 18 months has accelerated net and organic sales growth for our company are returning us to our long-term growth target range of 3 to 5%. Uh, happily, this acceleration was driven by increased investment behind our purpose-driven brands. We talked about how important pr purpose was back in Cagney. And uh, we've done a lot of work on our innovation strategy, getting that right, 
uh, focusing on fewer line extensions and really trying to deliver real impactful innovation across our big core businesses, uh, accelerating our innovation in the premium segment as well as rapidly growing adjacencies. And a strategy that has us building significant muscle in new areas for the company that we think will stand well as we move out of the crisis, particularly for the next couple of years, and that's in the areas of e-commerce, digital, and data and analytics. It's a focused strategy that has delivered broad-based organic sales growth, which we think is very, very important for us across our geographies and categories in 2019. We delivered growth across all four of our categories in 2019 and all six of our operating divisions in 2019. And the underlying quality of that growth was well-balanced across both emerging and developed markets with a really good price mix, a uh, mix of price and volume. Uh, for our growth to be sustainable, we recognize how important it is this balance continues, both in emerging and developed, as well as managing price and volume in an ever-changing marketplace. Pleasingly, our organic sales growth has accelerated as we went throughout the year. You saw that, obviously, in the fourth quarter and showing that our strategies and investments are paying off, and we continue to see that acceleration in the first quarter with Q1 up 7.5% uh, versus the same period year ago, a strong start to the year, although obviously some of that was built uh, based on some pantry load that we saw coming in the first quarter where we see some of that coming out in the second and third quarters. To remind you what we talked about in our Q1 earnings call, uh, we highlighted the uncertainty and unpredictability of the second and third order impacts from the crisis. It's the unknowns of the unknown, so to speak. Uh, that includes shutdowns, uh, other supply chain disruptions, continued volatility and consumption patterns, quite frankly, all over the world, and the economic volatility that will likely come after the crisis is over. And as, we, as a result of that, we, uh, we elected to withdraw our 2020 guidance in 2020. As we also mentioned in our prepared comments in our Q1 call, our sales momentum continued in April. We saw good growth in that month and that we expected foreign exchange, unfortunately, to have a negative mid-single-digit impact to our net sales. In terms of our priorities for 2020, we're going to focus on successfully managing through the crisis. It's not over, but staying true to our core values. We realize how important that is for not only our teams and then their safety, but the communities in which we serve. Uh, the heightened uh, focus across the organization, in my view, has really helped us execute far better than we ever have in the short term, making decisions quickly, uh, getting the agility on the grounds to the teams where the decisions need to be made, and ensuring while, we do, while we're doing that to have an eye on the future to make sure our long-term strategies are sustainable and enduring and we can continue that momentum for the, for the foreseeable future. And I have to say I'm incredibly proud of, of what our Colgate people have achieved this year, the incre incredible resilience that they've shown to, to weather the storm, so to speak, I think is a testament to the leadership and the depth of the talent we have across the organization. So as we look forward, I think we're very well positioned. We have an exceptional and experienced management team. You'll hear from one of those members today. Uh, and we understand how to deal with a crisis. Where for years and years, we've dealt with volatility in markets like Venezuela, Russia, Argentina, and others. Uh, we have a really strong portfolio of trusted brands in growing categories today, particularly in the health and hygiene space. And all those categories compete across multiple price points, which we, think, which we believe position as well. We have, over the years, built widespread channel capabilities, including, uh, more recently, a real focus around growing our e-commerce business. You saw the great results we had in, in Q1, particularly in North America. Our supply chain uh, throughout this crisis has been incredibly resilient, but I have to say they're very focused on the long term. They don't want to be complacent. They're looking for uh, the ability to build more flexibility moving forward and continuing to truly automate our supply chain around the world. And we have a focused strategy that we believe will continue to unlock growth opportunities in the recovery in terms of how our categories are positioned and the specific innovation that we're looking to bring in a post-COVID world. Growth remains our top priority, as we have discussed for the last 18 months. And we thought now that uh, I'd have Panos take you through our specific growth strategies and how we're adapting to some of the changing consumer behaviors and market needs that we see in this environment. Panos, over to you. Uh, thank you, Noel, and uh, good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm uh, happy coming back to the conference after two years. Uh, 
even though not in Paris, as Noel said, but uh, let's hope that next year we will back to, uh, to normal. So uh, talking about growth, uh, the key growth drivers uh, we deploy are about improved uh, brand building and core innovation, uh, innovating to uh, gain share in how growth segments and adjacencies, expanding in uh, new channels and online, and something very strategic for us to continuously invest in to drive penetration in growing population. And I'm going to talk, I'm talk, going to talk more specifically about them and share with you some uh, examples on key activities uh, for each one and how we adjust them in this new uh, environment. Starting with how we uh, are focusing on brand building and core innovation. Uh, core innovation is uh, very important uh, under the current market conditions and we need to ensure that we have very strong activities. Our core brands have the highest penetration. They are trusted by consumers for their quality and efficacy. And these are characteristics which are gaining importance in the current environment. Uh, they also provide choices across price points in a period where many consumers across the world do face economic challenges. And from our retail partner perspective, our core business considering the market shares that we uh, do have, uh, have a significant footprint in the categories we operate. So innovation, focus, activations on this part uh, of the business brings multiple benefits for them, and it is very much uh, uh, welcomed. Uh, I will share with you some ac examples across the world on activities on core business. Uh, as part of our advertising strategy, uh, we deploy uh, an equity campaign behind Colgate to support the Colgate master brand. Under the current conditions, we adapted this campaign under the theme of driving optimism in a very authentic and engaging way. Unfortunately, the format, uh, the virtual format, doesn't allow us to share with you some of the uh, videos. But the results were exceptional. In Latin America, in the course of five weeks, we did reach 145 million people, achieving double the historical engagement uh, ratios. We are rolling out the uh, restage of our base maximum cavity protection toothpaste that has major penetration across the world with a new formulation which offers the best cavity protection. We did relaunch with uh, a new, better formulation, our Colgate Total Toothpaste in over 100 countries, with very good results in most uh, markets. And moving to personal care, a brand that is very relevant in today's environment is Protex. Protex is the leading antibacterial soap in many parts of developing markets we compete. We are relaunching it with a new formulation based on flaxseed oil, which is a more natural formulation, a key benefit consumers look for today, and the product not only eliminates 99.9% .9 of bacteria, but strengthens the natural defense of the skin, offering 12-hour protection. It is being rolled out in the market uh, as we speak. In the home care category, we are introducing a new fabric softener line with a plant-based formulation. Actually, it is the first Fabcon with transparent formula, and it's having fully recyclable bottle and cup elements, which are also very important uh, uh, nowadays. My last example behind uh, uh, the core business relates to health and the importance and the impact of design in, uh, in the business. Uh, if you see on the right uh, side of the, uh, of the slide, this is our new science diet uh, packaging. The uh, Design Analytics Effectiveness Award was uh, created to help elevate the role of packaging design by highlighting the potential significant financial impact it can have on consumer brands. Winner selection is not subjective, it's entirely data-driven based on sales performance in the marketplace, as well as quantitative consumer testing. This year's award 
went to the company who are the uh, Birdwood uh, that designed this and are members of our global design team for their work on hill science diet. The design analytics evaluation revealed that pet owners are twice as likely to prefer purchasing hill science diet new packaging versus old. And this was confirmed by the sales data. During the six months after the relaunch with a new design, the brand grew at high double digit rate compared to the six months prior period. And it contributes significantly to the very good performance of our hills uh, business. The second uh, key driver, as Noel also mentioned, is about innovation in high growth segments and uh, adjacencies. Whitening toothpaste segment is very important in most markets uh, around the world. And we will share two very good examples from different regions on uh, what we do in that space. Uh, in the US, we launched our best hydrogen peroxide formulation to date with ability uh, to remove up to 10 years of yellow stains in the teeth at a very premium price point at uh, $7 with very good results, as the chart uh, illustrates, uh, reaching over 2% market share, which is incremental to our Optic White, which is our whitening uh, sub-brand, our whitening franchise in the uh, U.S. In Latin America, we introduced Luminous White Charcoal. Again, as the chart shows, with very high market share incrementality. And in the emerging natural segment, we introduced uh, Colgate natural extracts with uh, charcoal, which brought us significant share and incrementality in the two largest uh, markets in the region. These activities in Latin America, amongst others, uh, puts us in a position to realize market share growth on a year-to-date basis versus, uh, previous, pre uh, versus prior year, uh, something that uh, significantly contributes to the very strong performance of the Latin American region uh, uh, today. Uh, moving to personal care, uh, an example of strong brand performance where innovation and positioning are very relevant is our Sanex European Personal Care Equity. The position of the brand is about protecting your skin, its healthy uh, uh, skin, something very relevant under the current uh, environment. And as, you, as the chart demonstrates, we got leadership in European markets. We compete in uh, body wash. Uh, talking about uh, expanding in new channels and, uh, and markets, uh, we have talked the last uh, couple of years about our strategic expansion uh, of our Elmex European brands in new markets uh, outside uh, Europe. And we are doing very good progress uh, here. Uh, Brazil is a key market where we launched uh, Elmex in the pharmacy uh, channel at uber premium price point. And you can see the steady progress we are making in terms of uh, market share growing even under the current uh, challenging conditions. This is toothpaste. We have the same strong results in toothpaste, in toothbrushes uh, as well. Trade channel shift can be significant and can impact the performance of the business, uh, obviously. We see this with e-commerce, but also uh, beyond e-commerce. So it's key to grow above the market and to have, ideally, higher shares versus average in the growing channels in each of the markets we compete. If I look in Latin America, the two fastest growing channels are cash and carries and discounters, and we do very well in both. If you see uh, Brazil that is uh, presented in this chart, uh, we grow in cash and carries, which is by far the fastest growing retail environment in the last years, above the market. And our market shares, which are in the, uh, the numbers in the right side of the, uh, of the slide, are significantly higher than the national average in all the major categories we compete in toothpaste, in toothbrushes, and in uh, uh, bar soaps. Uh, the same happens with discounters, where our brand development index is nearly double than uh, uh, average. So we are very well positioned in the growing channels in the market. And as they grow 
in importance. Uh, talking about uh, online uh, e-commerce, uh, it's, I guess, in the headlines uh, everywhere the last month, and it's growing across the world. So uh, maximizing the growth of our online business is one of our key objectives, and uh, it's also one of the key contributors of our sales, uh, sales growth. Uh, if we look at North America, it's very well documented. E-commerce has an explosive uh, growth due to the uh, COVID uh, conditions. We deployed major activations across all platforms, and our net sales actually more than uh, uh, doubled. In heels, uh, high growth in e-commerce is a key contributor to the strong results that we have in this business. And this chart depicts the sales trajectory, the sales projection, progression of our business with Chewy, one of the key uh, uh, online uh, retailers for uh, pet food. And as you can uh, see, we grow significantly with Chewy for 14 straight quarters by deploying successful plans to acquire new customers, but also to increase compliance of our current customers, particularly increasing the number of, uh, net pa of pet parents that they are in an auto seat uh, scheme, something that has uh, very obvious benefits in terms of loyalty for our, uh, for our business. But I would say beyond established e-com markets like uh, the U.S., uh, we do very well in the emerging e-commerce markets, like uh, Southeast Asia, where uh, Shopee and Lazada, the partners of uh, JP and uh, Ali, uh, respectively, grow very uh, aggressively. Our strong focus and effective activations uh, in the region uh, leading us to double our uh, e-com uh, sales in the, uh, in the first quarter. Finally, uh, an area which is very strategic and very important for us is the systematic investment to promote oral health and to drive penetration of the oral care uh, family of uh, products. We have talked about our Bright Smiles, Bright Futures uh, program. We have educate, educated one billion kids uh, today on uh, brushing, and we aim to reach 1.3 billion by uh, 2020. And thanks to close cooperation with local authorities, oral hygiene, the education around oral hygiene, is getting into schools curriculum, like in Mexico City and Veracruz regions of Mexico, where we reach 2.2 million kids. 2.2 million kids are getting educated in their classrooms around uh, oral hygiene and we plan to expand in three new states. And in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the largest uh, uh, city in the country, where we just agreed with the Ministry of Education to help provide the same oral hygiene uh, uh, training to 3.5 million kids in public uh, uh, schools. I have to say we are very proud for these initiatives and the potential positive impact they have to the communities we do serve with our, uh, uh, with our products. And with this, I will uh, hand over back to you, Noel, to talk about sustainability and some closing comments. Thank you. Thanks, Panos. Uh, so clearly, we're, we're laser focused on growth, as we've been discussing for the last 18 months. And we know it's, it's vital to maintain that momentum and build ongoing sustainability across the business. Uh, but we also recognize that our overall sustainability strategy goals need to continue to be increased. And we've done a wonderful job through 2020, and we're now in the midst of refreshing our goals for 2025. Uh, specifically in that light, we recognize that as the one of the highest penetra penetration brands in the world, we have this incredible opportunity and we're uniquely positioned to work with consumers to build a healthy, sustainable future through both our actions and our education with them. And so we're going to use that household penetration as a new way to express our commitment to sustainability and outline our 2025 sustainability goals. You see reflected on the chart here that our, our new expression is Colgate invites 1 billion homes to create a healthy and sustainable future. 
We understand the responsibility we have as a global brand and a brand that is highly penetrated, and we believe we can have the uh, proper influence on consumers to improve the world moving forward. Uh, here are a few highlights of our strategy, our 2025 goals. Uh, you'll see there are many uh, in, in very specific areas. They are bold, they are ambas uh, am ambitious, but uh, very achievable. I won't go through them all, but let me focus on two that are, that are very relevant today. Uh, zero waste. We already are a leading, uh, we lead the world in the number of uh, zero waste facilities across the world, both in geography and scope, and we have a plan to get to 100% zero waste facilities uh, by 2025. We know plastics is also a growing area of concern for consumers, and we are deeply committed to lowering our usage of plastics. As we have discussed with you previously, we've launched the first rec recognized recyclable toothpaste tube in the world, and importantly, we're going to be sharing that technology with others so we can ultimately get to a, a time when all tubes in the category are recyclable. And everyone can have access to that report. Uh, if you go on to colgatepamalov.com, uh, you can access it through our sustainability tab, and you can see, one, the terrific progress we've made in delivering our 2020 goals and the ambitions that we've set for ourselves and our teams for 2025. So quickly to finish up, uh, I think we've got the right portfolio in place to win in this crisis and post the crisis. Uh, we know we have the right organization. The Colgate uh, bench has always been strong uh, with incredible experiences dealing with these types of things. Uh, we regained organic sales growth momentum that we needed to to deliver, uh, importantly, future growth for the business. And our focus is obviously continuing to do that in the back half of 2020 and through 2021. And with that, Steve, uh, let me turn it back over to you for any questions. That's great. Uh, thanks to you both for, for running through that. I, I guess the first question is, as you think about all that you've been prioritizing the past 12 to 18 months, Noel, since you took over as CEO, um, much of which I think you and Panos just took us through in some respects, do you, do you think that work has in some ways better prepared you for this moment um, around COVID-19 than would have been otherwise? And as you think about how the organization has, has met the current crisis, which you sound, you sound generally pleased with, how, how much of, of that has required holding new thinking versus more uh, perhaps just an acceleration of the strategy that you were already employing? Yeah, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, good question. A little serendipity, I think, as we uh, – is, as a team, as we really started to refocus our orientation around growth, uh, some two years ago, uh, we recognized that we had incredible strengths to build from, but that we needed to make changes. Uh, we needed to make changes in how we thought about innovation. Uh, you've heard that loud and clear through our focus on our core businesses, which are big and important around the year and carry a lot of the equity attributes of our brands. Uh, we needed to rethink about premium innovation, which is a space that we are significantly under-indexed in. And even in a recession, we believe affordable luxury will still have a play uh, and will position us for opportunities and growth moving forward. Uh, we recognize that channel shifting and consumer behavior uh, was happening faster than we were adapting to that, and we needed to make the necessary changes, uh, both in our structure and our approach. And you've seen that, I think, um, uh, come through in terms of our channel expansion with brands and the growth we've seen, particularly in the focus uh, that we've given to e-commerce. Uh, all of those things have positioned us extremely well, uh, but at the core of all of this, I think, is, you know, how do we continue to adopt our culture in the company? And we recognize that we needed to be agile. We recognize that we needed to work differently as an organization and as a team. And we've spent the better part of 18 months really refining those processes and thinking about how we want to operate differently moving forward. And lo and behold, COVID hits and all those things we talked about, streamlining processes, agility, flexibility in our operations, uh, getting the innovation right and reacting quicker, all have played out extremely well uh, for the crisis. And we were able to really hit the ground running uh, day one, transferring best practices around the world uh, from Asia to Europe uh, to LATAM to the U.S., and uh, moving with very little disruption. And obviously there's a lot of unpredictability and uncertainty moving forward, uh, but we feel we're, we're well positioned for that. And our, particularly our portfolio, as you look at a post-COVID environment, 
where uh, there's no question we will we will enter a recession in many geographies, and the fact that we have historically been very strong across multiple price points, particularly entry price points, we think positions as well. So as you think about the 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 post the post COVID landscape, are there elements of what you've been working against that um, need to be you know, rethought or, or added to, or is there, is there a new leg to the strategy um, influenced by, by what we're going through now that you know, will play a key role as you think about the remainder of 2020 and into 21? Yeah, part of uh, the, the strategic work that we, we undertook was really looking at capabilities. And uh, we, we, we really fine-tuned it to three important areas. We talked about innovation, and, you know, fortunately, we had uh, a couple years head start, our core innovation accelerated. And our core innovation, as I mentioned, uh, we believe plays really well in, in a post-COVID world, particularly as economies enter recession and consumers are looking for uh, perhaps more value, but value that delivers uh, true efficacy and true, um, and, 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 and true benefits to them. So we're very focused on that aspect. Uh, you will still see premium be a, a core part of our strategy. As I mentioned, we're very under-indexed, but we will shift a little bit more to, to core, uh, given where we think consumers are moving. Uh, but fortunately, the strategy that we had in place, Steve, is, is, is such that it's nuanced in terms of what we need to change. So we're not making wholesale changes to how we, we want to execute around the world. Uh, and from that perspective, we think uh, that distinguishes us right now, that we're not making big changes to how we operate uh, from a, a supply chain standpoint, to how we want to innovate, to the focus areas that we think are priority growth, uh, growth areas. So right now it's nuanced. Second one is around digital. We've uh, been on a, a, a focus strategy for a better part of two years now as well on how do we improve our digital capabilities, how do we digitize the company. And there's so much opportunity yet in that space for us moving forward. I think we're just getting started, quite frankly, uh, in terms of how we think about digitization across the organization from both our media, our content, our data piece, to our supply chain, to our R&D organization, even in our HR and finance organizations. We're thinking how to digitize and really drive the productivity through that initiative. And the third is, is what we've talked about quite a bit is our channel strategies. And, and we think... The, the changes that we need to make around channels are exactly what we were doing. We were focused on e-commerce. We were focused on thinking about e uh, our discount uh, discounters around the world very differently. We were focused on taking our brand portfolio around the world uh, in locations where it was most relevant. Uh, we've talked about Elmex and Meridol where we go into um, – High, uh, high pharmacy areas of, around the world where pharmacy is an important retail environment and we're under indexed there. We didn't have the right brand strategy, so we're thinking about that differently. And then the lastly is obviously positioning us well through the acquisitions. No question the skin health will go through a short-term disruption. Uh, we spent a lot of time going back to 08 and 09 to understand how skin health brands performed, premium skin health brands. And uh, there's no question they came out of that uh, actually quite strong. But during the, the two years of recession, they suffered. Uh, we're pivoting as necessary to adopt to those changes. But long term, the economics of that business, both from a financial and a consumer standpoint, are very, very attractive to us. And we think, uh, quite frankly, the time that we're spending now to get the fundamentals right and the capabilities right will position us well as we come out of the, um, out of the crisis. Right. On the on your first quarter earnings call, you, you spent a, a good deal of time kind of walking around the world, um, outlining what you were expecting from a, a consumption pattern standpoint, and also just the general pace of economic uh, reopening, uh, just general ac economic activity. Has have what you've seen so far in the quarter? If you just match what you've seen against what you had said there, are there? Um, are there any call outs in terms of the progress you're seeing? And I guess I'm, I'm particularly focused on, on the U.S. and, the, and your brick markets. Um, but, you know, any color you have would be, would be welcome. Sure. Thank you. Sure. You know, listen, let, let me start with a, from a category perspective first. You know, around the world, we've continued to see uh, those categories that have certainly benefited from, uh, from COVID. And, and that is what we would say more systemic behavior changes that consumers are driving. 
and we think those are quite sticky. There's categories like liquid hand soap that continue to be very robust around the world. Uh, our dish business around the world is consumers uh, work from home. Uh, we've seen an acceleration in that category. Obviously, our, our home care products, specifically cleaners and, and our sprays in Europe, we've seen uh, behavior changes where consumers are obviously uh, disinfecting their homes more often and cleaning their homes more often. So those categories, we think, will continue to be uh, to be quite healthy moving forward. Uh, will they stay at the current levels forever? Absolutely not. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see, we're watching that very closely. We have seen other categories post the pantry load come down in recent, uh, in, in recent weeks. You've seen the scanner data obviously in Europe and the scanner data in, in U.S. that reflect that. As you look geographically, uh, clearly the U.S. Is, 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 and the emerging markets specifically are really benefiting uh, from the uh, the pantry loads over time, and obviously as uh, bigger homes, more per capita income, consumers can handle more product in their homes, and you've seen that play out both in the U.S. and in Europe. And we, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen the destocking start certainly in some of uh, in some of our categories in the U.S. But the U.S. continues to be quite uh, quite healthy. Uh, Europe, uh, obviously, post uh, post the the pantry load, we've seen a slowdown uh, in Europe in, in terms of category performance. Africa has been uh, somewhat of a surprise, as you would expect. As I mentioned, uh, the countries have had to really lock down. I think, given uh, their concern around the capabilities they had to handle the crisis, particularly from a healthcare standpoint, and. That has uh, created more disruptions in that market. Uh, we're starting to see, in fact, I was on the phone uh, this morning uh, with both our president of Asia and our president of Africa, and they both uh, have remarked that all those economies are now starting to open up, and so we'll see improved performance in the categories moving forward. Uh, Asia, as we've mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of disruption in the first quarter, particularly out of India. I mentioned up front that India is starting to come back. And particularly our manufacturing standpoint, we saw economies uh, locked down, whether it was in the Philippines for a period of time, uh, deep recessionary aspects in Thailand. So a lot of volatility in that region, but we're starting to see our, uh, particularly our China business, which we've talked about at length, we're starting to see uh, the recovery there as consumers move back into the brick and mortar. Obviously online was still very robust, but not enough to offset some of the declines they saw in brick and mortar. And lastly, in Latin America, our focus in Latin America right now has obviously been to uh, to recover uh, the transactional impact moving through the P&L uh, as a result of the foreign exchange headwinds that we've seen uh, over the last uh, couple months and uh, plan uh, ensuring that our revenue growth management strategies are there. Uh, you heard Panos talk about good market share growth across Latin America. And that's important, particularly in an environment where you're taking pricing, and we'll continue to uh, watch uh, those uh, regions quite, quick, uh, quite closely. Brazil, somewhat of a concern as you see the increase in cases there, uh, but our teams are, are doing a good job uh, to deal with the situation. Um, great. And maybe if we drill down on where you ended up in Latin America, um, and maybe, Panos, maybe this is a good question for you. I guess, can you... I guess, what's your confidence level um, at this point through pricing and revenue growth, growth management broadly that you will be able to um, recoup at least a good portion of that transactional FX you know, headwind? And I guess how do, how do we guard against um, at least an investor perception that if we kind of rewind the clock you know, five years ago or so that, um, that, that too much pricing was, was gone after um, in your region to the extent that, to, to which caused sort of derivative effects afterwards that had to be um, recovered. So I guess the question is just how confident are you in the progress and how are you mitigating against the risk of a, of a repeat um, of what happened in the middle of last decade? Sure. Let me, let me provide yeah. some opening comments to that, Steve, and, and then I'll, um, I'll let Panos uh, answer that uh, more specifically. You know, listen, uh, you know, pricing is our best friend. Uh, we have historically, uh, over, over decades, recognized that you ultimately you've got to get the pricing through the P&L to recover transaction. There may be some short-term blips associated with it. We will certainly see volume uh, come down. Uh, but we've learned over the years that the best way to recover that is you've got to continue to provide a plethora of innovation in the market across all price points. And we've learned uh, sometimes that we can't be overly focused on one segment that we have to have broad-based innovation in order to ensure 
uh, the, the innovation plus our revenue growth management strategy, which has been uh, fine-tuned over the last two years, positions us well to recover as much of that pricing as possible while maintaining our market share growth. No question you will see some volumes fall off in the short term, uh, but long term it's getting the, protecting the margin that we can continue to invest in building the brands and delivering innovation to the market. And in the end, that's a long-term strategy that we've learned plays out the best. We need to elevate our, our innovation in that respect. Panos, any th anything you want to add to that? No, I think you. Uh, uh, this is what we do, and uh, the only comment I would uh, I would add is that uh, we are taking pricing. Indeed, it's our best friend, and there is no other option uh, when you operate with this uh, level of devaluation. But our pricing is not excessive or uh, non-prudent, uh, and we deploy pricing in a very, I would say, uh, diligent way. We do. Uh, list price adjustments, we adjust our promotional plans, we deploy uh, other uh, tools around the revenue growth management uh, uh, toolkit, uh, we deploy very specific innovation uh, plans, entering potentially new price points and making sure that we offer uh, different choices to, uh, to consumers, and we monitor the business on a continuous basis. So when the balance between volume and price uh, starts turning uh, negative as a final uh, outcome, uh, we do the necessary uh, uh, adjustments. So I have to say, uh, I, I wouldn't say that I am confident, as you said, uh, uh, Steve, because uh, in this world, uh, nobody knows how the external environment could evolve. But I would say I'm uh, rather optimistic that we will be able to uh, manage well as we have managed uh, in all previous crises uh, historically in Latin America. And at the end of the day, we do emerge uh, stronger. And if uh, we see our market share uh, performance uh, so far and the fundamentals uh, metrics uh, of the business, uh, we do well. We do better than the, uh, the competition. So we have uh, every reason to be uh, a positive for the future. Great. When I, as I think about um, different U.S. CPG companies and their philosophy, um, there, there are those who, who manage to dollar-based metrics and those who, who manage to constant currency-based metrics. I think you, know, you guys have always been on the, the dollar-based side of that, of that question. And there are also companies that um, manage to margin or that now increasingly are managing to uh, you know, a dollar-based profit growth um, objective. Um, how do you think about those, you know, debates to the extent that that's too strong a word or, or a fair word? Um, and what, where do you think the, the right um, points of emphasis for Colgate are? Well, it's a moving target, Steve. It, you know, it's a balance all the time, and it's I, you know, I think it plays back into the discussion uh, where we need to have flexibility and agility to adapt to local situations and. You know, historically, we have always believed that growing dollar EPS in the long term is the, the best way to grow shareholder value, and uh, we will continue to be resolute in that regard. Uh, but we manage a, a lot of factors in that regard. There's a lot of inputs that go into making decisions, you know, from market share to margins, as you mentioned, to transactional costs, to translational impacts, uh, to the competitive situation. So all of those decisions are taken uh, where they need to be by the teams that best understand what's going on in the local marketplace. But in the end, if you boil it down to just a couple things, you know, we're looking to drive consistent top-line growth, getting the leverage through the P&L, however that uh, unfolds, to ultimately deliver uh, improved uh, earnings per share growth. And, and to do that, a lot of decisions have to be taken on the ground, and it starts with, in my view, with a very clear strategy on what you're trying to execute. So you don't get into a lot of debates and tensions on what you're trying to achieve. Obviously, the numbers in the end are the numbers, but we're very focused on ensuring our teams are clear on what we're trying to achieve and the choices that we're making and the bets that we're making in that regard. So it's a balance across a multiple dimensions, Steve, and we continue to, to, to be consistent with what we've done historically, but recognizing uh, that we have to be adaptable uh, to the changing circumstances, and we believe we're doing that. That's great. Okay, well, I think we're about out of time, um, but I, I guess I'd like to close with a question um, in terms of if you, if you were advising investors um, as to what the most critical success factors are for 
for Colgate over the next, say, six to nine months? Um, where would you point their attention? Yeah, again, um, very consistent with what we talked about today. You know, you need uh, companies need to have clear strategies executed, particularly big global companies where you're operating in 200 markets around the world. Uh, strategies that uh, build on both the core and the premium opportunities that you have. Uh, you need to have strategies that are adaptable to the rapidly changing consumer behaviors, and we're using insights and data and analytics far better than we ever have. Our teams are able to react really quickly based on inputs and adjust that accordingly in the marketplace. That's the agility that we talked to earlier. Uh, we need to ensure that we have an innovation strategy that is not only short-term focused, uh, but long-term focused as well, and we've made uh, quite a considerable change in that space around our organization to ensure that we have dedicated resources on the short term and dedicated separate resources on the long term and not mixing the two. We think we're going to get much better quality innovation. So a clear strategy, making the right choices, having the right portfolio of brands, uh, particularly across various price points in a recessionary economy, and then ultimately, we talked a little bit about it, which is something that's so important to me, and that's a winning culture, and a culture that we believe is proud of what they're doing in the communities in which we serve, a culture that's leading and developing people for the future, and a culture that is built on strong collaboration and an innovative, an innovative spirit. So ultimately, that's what it really comes down to. And uh, we, we're, we're quite excited about what we've got going on, but we've certainly got a lot to do moving forward. Well, the, the cultural momentum that you've put in place is pretty evident from the outside. We didn't get into it, but a, a lot of what you've done um, around innovation with some of the, the better leveraging of predictive tools and data analytics is a, is a topic unto itself. So but we'll leave that for another time. Noel, Panos, um, and John, thanks so much for your time and for your participation. And I uh, hope everybody, including the three of you, have a great conference. Thank you, Steve, and uh, be safe, everyone. So long. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.